Good morning, everybody. Today we have an exciting topic. It's about SQL Server on Linux or Linux, however you want to say it. And it's called a modern data platform. We have two speakers, are Janice Fernandez and Patrick Quiroli. I'm Sharon Dooley. I'm the moderator for the session. I've got a few boilerplate slides that I need to present, and then I'll turn the presentation over to our speakers. Come on, PowerPoint. We have two sponsors, one of whom is speaking today. That's SUSE, the, the green salamander or whatever it is. And our other sponsor is Quest. They'll be speaking to us early next year. And we are very grateful to our sponsors. They are what enable us to send you all prizes, raffle prizes every week at every meeting. Uh, we have just finished the elections for the past board of directors. And the, the three candidates who won are Roberto Fonseca, Lori Edwards, and Jennifer Moser. And they will start on January 1st, 2019. There's another past marathon coming up. Uh, it's the developer edition, and it's on December 12th. Uh, visit your past.org and register for the marathon if you wish to attend. Uh, SQL Saturdays are quiet right now. It is nearing the holidays, and there's only a few of them scheduled. Uh, most of the year, I have a full-page slide of SQL Saturdays all over the world. If you've never been to one, they're well worth your going to. They're free all-day training events, and there's bound to be one within a short distance of you once the year gets rolling. PASS is always looking for new sponsors like SUSE and Quest. Uh, if, the spon if you know somebody with great content who are perfect, uh, let, us, let the leadership at PASS know. If the person ends up being a sponsor, uh, you'll receive a $100 gift card. We are one of many virtual groups. They're all over the world. I'm sorry, they're all over the technology and all over the world. There are some that are, dedicated, are language specific and some that are technology specific. We're the database administration virtual group. One I'm very committed to is Women in Technology. Uh, they have a few webinars, but they also put out a great newsletter. And uh, as a woman in technology myself, I'm very anxious to have people support them. Connect with PASS. You can get um, all the, ha whatever they are, Twitter things. Uh, I, as you can see, I'm not a Twitter user. Um, they're on this slide. Our Twitter handle is on an initial slide. And I want to introduce our presenters. Uh, our Janice is a principal program manager with the Microsoft SQL Server team in Redmond. In his role, he owns the relationship with some of the largest SQL Server customers in the world and actively engages with OEM and hardware partners. On the technical side of things, Argenis handles program management for certain SQL Server database engine features. More recently, he has been focused on persistent memory support. Previously, he worked as a principal architect for pure storage as a lead data-based operations engineer at SurveyMonkey. In SQL Server, uh, sorry, in 2013, he founded the security virtual chat, chat 
director for PASH. He's a SQL community enthusiast and speaks frequently at many conferences. He's also a Microsoft certified master. And unlike me, he is an avid Twitter user and his Twitter name is there. Patrick has 20, more than 20 years of IT experience with 12 years focused on Linux and open source solutions. Previously, he was responsible for managing the global alliance at SUSE. Now he's focused on technical innovation and business development with SUSE's key alliance partners. Patrick leads and supports a team of solution architects across the globe who are focused on co-innovation and helping customers benefit from a software-defined center, both on-premise and in the cloud. And now I want to make our Genesis a presenter and turn the meeting over to them. Go for it, our Genesis. Thank you so much, Sharon. I am starting to share my screen. Hopefully, everyone will be able to see it in just a minute. I can see it. Wonderful. So good morning, everybody. It is bright and early here on the West Coast. Uh, I'm, you know, those of you who are were adventurous enough to join us super early from the uh, from the West Coast, uh, uh, we appreciate your time today. Uh, so today we're going to talk about how SQL Server on Linux is actually a great modern pla data platform. You know, guys. Uh, a couple of years ago, we rocked the industry when we announced the fact that we were going to come out with support for SQL, for, for Linux on, on SQL Server. And it hasn't really been very long since we uh, rolled out product. It was only last year uh, when we rolled out SQL Server 2017, which was the first version of SQL Server that actually supported uh, Linux as a platform. And, you know, Linux is, no operating system that is everywhere around us today, right? It can be found on microcontrollers all the way to mega servers on data centers, right? So it's such a different uh, uh, proposition to run SQL Server on, on a, such a versatile operating system. You know, it was really visionary from uh, folks on our, on our team, on the engineering team, when they decided to go forward with this uh, a, a few years ago, and I would say, uh, you know, it's it's been a wild ride. You know, we released SQL Server 2016, and only a year after, we were already coming out with uh, with SQL Server on Linux. And now, on SQL Server 2019, which is uh, slated for release next year, uh, we are increasing the footprint of SQL Server on Linux and the amount of features uh, that were uh, available on Windows were not, were not available on Linux is shrinking super, super fast. Uh, we're dedicating a significant amount of engineering uh, time to uh, to all of those features to make sure that we have feature parity across the platforms. Because you guys requested it. And things like replication, for example. Uh, transactional replication was not available on SQL Server on Linux when, when it was released in 2017. But we have announced it now for uh, for SQL Server 2019, and we are actually uh, uh, looking into uh, backporting it to, to previous versions as well. Anyway, Patrick, do you want to take this? Yeah, I will. Thank you, Arjunas. Um And actually, just a, a funny little story. Uh, so I was at the Microsoft conference when uh, support for Linux was announced on SQL. Um, you guys had done a, a blog, I'm sorry, a, a web host show. And uh, it, it was really <clears throat> interesting to, to see the, the excitement about Microsoft engaging a, a tier one product into um, onto an open source platform. And a, a funny story, you know, just to kind of demonstrate Microsoft's uh, ability to uh, adapt um, and their ability to, to execute in an effort such as this. Um, it wasn't long after that initial, I think it was Microsoft Ignite conference that I actually had sat down with one of SUSE's product managers for SUSE Linux Enterprise. And if anyone here is familiar with SUSE, we have product managers all over the world, but we have a number of product managers in Germany. And this particular product manager um, 
stopped the conversation and said, I, I want to tell you something. And I want to tell you something about Microsoft. And I kind of sat back in my chair and I thought, oh, goodness, here it comes. He goes, <laughs> Microsoft has released one of the best packaged RPMs with their SQL distribution that I have ever seen. Now, if anybody's familiar with Linux, RPMs is one of the package managers that we use in Linux to actually deploy and install applications. And, and occasionally the package managers or the, the people who are responsible for packaging applications get a little overzealous and occasionally they get a little lazy depending on who you're dealing with. And, and sometimes they'll bundle in additional libraries and capabilities inside of the package that aren't necessary. And other times they make too many assumptions about what's available. And he says, the Microsoft Package Manager is well documented, or the RPM document is well documented. It's well structured. It's really, really a good testament to what they're doing in the open source community. And I was like, wow. So that's a testament to you and your team. And I, and I wanted to just share that with you. Um, but what we're actually here to talk about is uh, modern data platform. And, and this slide kind of talks a little bit about the, the continuum of change that we're seeing uh, across multiple disciplines within IT. Um, whether it's whether your focus is in IT infrastructure, where SUSE plays a significant role, or whether it's in application deployment or application architecture, you'll see the different waves of change that impact those different disciplines from left to right. You know, we started off with uh, a typical data center, maybe a, a, a monolithic infrastructure. Um, we went to a hosted um, and managed infrastructure and we're now you know starting the conversations around public cloud and hybrid cloud. Uh, we, we've moved through physical servers and virtual servers and now moving moving into containerization and from an application architecture perspective um, microservices with that containerization of applications is starting to play a role. And, and if you kind of look down the, the right-hand side of this slide, the, the cloud, the containers, microservices, and, and when you get into the data platform, the, the evolution from siloed data to data warehouses to now we get into data streaming and virtualization and data lakes, you kind of see that, you should be able to see that somewhere along the left to right axis of this slide, you can probably place your business. You can probably put yourself in, in either the right column or the center column or the center moving to right. And, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about today is how Linux can kind of help you in that transition from left to right, from monolithic to microservices, or uh, again, adopt different data platforms in order to solve the, the needs of your business. Okay, Arjenis, back to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Brenda. Folks, so uh, today one of the things I want uh, we wanted to discuss with you is uh, SQL Server 2019 and how it actually enables intelligence all over your data. But this is not just a marketing slide. I mean, it does feel marketing, so I have to apologize for that. But you know what, guys? On SQL Server 2019, we've actually built uh, a great platform that enables you to not only look at your relational data as it traditionally has been the case for SQL Server, right? <clears throat> and we have had, you know, the sporadic support for unstructured data sets like XML we have had for you know, a number of years. And we also enabled support for JSON. And back in the day, we have Polybase uh, 1.0, which is, it's, uh, it's been around for a couple of versions already. And that enables Enable SQL Server to look at all the data sets, you know, external data sets maybe sitting on other and on on other servers and running on other infrastructures. But now SQL Server 2019 takes this concept to an entirely new level. Right? SQL Server 2019 with uh, its big data clusters feature, uh, it's now quite honestly it's taken the industry by storm. Uh, the concept here is that we're enabling data virtualization. Uh, we are making SQL Server a single point of entry into your all your data in your entire uh, uh, topology and your data center and your enterprise. So one of the things that's super interesting about uh, big data clusters is that it not only does it enable data virtualization per se by 
having SQL Server be that point of entry into those different systems, that, as I mentioned before. But big data clusters also sort of enables data firewalling in a way. And what I mean by this is that you can actually take data sets that are existing on different systems and, and make them available, but keeping the rules of engagement with that data within SQL Server itself. So that's kind of interesting because you're not, you don't, don't necessarily have to spread out all your security configuration about your, how data is accessed in your environment throughout all these different disparate systems. You can centralize security for accessing your data and your enterprise now in SQL Server with big data clusters. So it's about being able to bring relational and unstructured data sets into the mix on the same, under the same umbrella having the, capa the capability of scaling out you know, whenever you need more nodes to handle that unstructured data or whenever you need more nodes to allow you to join data sets. Uh, it's, it's a very radical concept on, on, on how uh, SQL Server used to be seen. SQL Server is traditionally just a scale-up so, uh, scale solution. The only scale uh, or traditionally the only scale-out solutions for SQL Server were availability groups. But now with uh, now with big, big data clusters, we're taking a huge step forward on one, uh, what SQL Server can actually address. Um, one of the super cool features about SQL Server 2019 is that, you know, once, once you have all this entire infrastructure behind a master node on a big data cluster, uh, you can only access the master node and run all your reporting, all your AI, all, of the, all of your analytics on top of that master node. So it's a very, different way of looking at things. So hopefully the next slides would actually make this a little clearer for you guys. But what what are we trying to achieve with big data clusters really? Uh, we're trying to bring into the fold not just your traditional SQL Server data, which may be your high value data sitting on, on a relational database, but also embracing other data sets and maybe sitting on uh, on external uh, on external hosts or external VMs or external infrastructures like MongoDB, Teradata, DB2, or maybe even SAP. Right? So you can have a single point of entry into you, all of your data sets in your environment uh, with SQL Server 2019. One of the things that we're doing that's very radical, right? We, we went radical with SQL Server on Linux. On SQL Server 2019, we kicked it up a notch and what we're doing now is fully embracing Apache Spark, which is a data streaming and, and, and data crunching solution that is just fantastic. Uh, we are now fully embracing Apache Spark and on the same pod, and we'll talk about what pods are in just a second, you are now having a SQL Server engine and an Apache Spark uh, runtime running on the exact same uh, uh, Kubernetes pod. And I'll talk about Kubernetes in a second. But this is a very different way of looking at things from our point of view. And we're enabling management of all of this through a single point of view, so single point pane of glass, which is Azure Data Studio. And Azure Data Studio is going to be your one tool where you're going to connect to uh, all your resources on your on, on your big data cluster and manage it all from a single uh, from a single point. You know, guys, one thing that I, that I wanted to make perfectly clear, and I keep getting some comments here and there about this. So that SSMS is not going away anytime soon, right? SQL Server Management Studio is here to stay. We're making big investments on SQL Server Management Studio as well, right? We will, will continue to develop that product. It will, it will continue to get updates. And we will continue to take your feedback and, and bake those features that are most important to you, right? So if you guys don't know the URL for uh, providing feedback to us, it's aka.ms slash SQL feedback. You're welcome to go there and just enter feedback for us. We we do read everything that you submit through there. We route it accordingly to the uh, to the appropriate engineering teams, and we make decisions on what to prioritize for the next versions based on you know business needs and your feedback. Your feedback is super important for us. So please submit it. Anyway, he, this is a more uh, this is more of a you know a hands-on slide on what SQL Server 2019 Big Data Cluster is all about, right? So we are. You don't have to have big data clusters on SQL Server 2019. Let me make that perfectly clear, right? You can have your traditional SQL Server instances, 
And if you want to access external data sets without creating an entire big data cluster, you can definitely leverage Polybase 2.0, which is going to be shipping with SQL Server 19. And it's available today on, on SQL Server 2019 CTP 2.1, which is the latest one that we released. And if you guys have been paying attention to the pace of development that we are that we have uh, going on at Microsoft these days, we are cranking out CTPs extremely fast, okay? So with SQL Server 2019, you can leverage Polybase 2.0 to access all of these different data sets. As long as they're ODBC compliant, you're welcome to start, to, to start bringing them into the fall today. But Big Data Clusters actually enables you to have a full on scale out solution based on Kubernetes and, and on every pod, you can now have SQL Server and the Spark Runtime tuck into an underlying HDFS store. If you guys are not familiar with, familiar with HDFS, I highly encourage you to uh, go take a look at that. It's the file system or the scalable file system that's, uh, that's powered Hadoop for a number of years now. But what we've done is that we've now enabled SQL Server to natively read from HDFS. Okay, read and write to HDFS. So SQL Server can actually be, handle HDFS just like it handles your database files sitting on NTFS or REFS uh, volumes today, okay? Or your XFS or EXT4 file systems on Linux. We are now in, in being able to access HDFS volumes as well, okay? So you can have your data lake, existing data lake in your environment today, and SQL Server can now tap into that, okay? So it's a it's a very, game-changing proposition here. The fact, that, the fact that SQL Server can now handle your relational data sets and your own structured data sets sitting on HDFS. So the idea is that we now provide SQL, with SQL Server 2019, we provide a complete AI platform where you can have your SQL Server and your all of the external, um, uh, with the extensibility sets that we have on SQL Server, you can now run you know, R scripts or Python scripts or even Java today. You can have all of this running uh, within the same memory space of SQL Server, the same machine. And now you can have Spark and Spark ML runtimes looking at all the same data, uh, uh, underlying data sets and providing the best uh, 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 platform for, for performing AI on premises. So this is uh, more of a architectural uh, old topology kind of, uh, but more of a, on the technical side of the side. Right? So if you, if you guys don't know what Kubernetes is, Kubernetes is basically just a container orchestration uh, uh, platform, and it's based on nodes, right? So you have your nodes where you can actually run um, your um, your uh, containers, right? So SQL Server 2019 Big Data Clusters is based on Kubernetes pods, which are, you know, basically just uh, uh, runtimes running on top on, on top of those containers, it, like single units of isolation. And then each and every single Kubernetes pod here can access an HDFS data node, right? This HDFS data node can be definitely pers on, on persistent storage, right? Uh, containers don't have to be dealing with ephemeral data all the time. This is a concept that's very important for SQL Server, right? Because SQL Server actually saves data and doesn't keep it around um, on, unless you save that data on a, on a persistent storage device. If you have a container and you're saving data within that container, the moment you delete that container, that container, go, that data that you wrote to that container goes away. But if you use persistent storage with containers, then whatever data you write to that persistent storage will remain after the lifetime of that container. So if you ever have to restart SQL Server, for example, yeah, that data that you wrote to that persistent storage will remain there. So if you can tell from this slide, Clearly, we have um, SQL, the SQL Server runtime and Spark runtime running on the exact same Kubernetes pod. The SQL Server master instance actually controls uh, through what we call a control plane now and enables the creation and destruction of uh, multiple Kubernetes pods uh, that can directly read from HDFS. And so we have the concepts of storage pool, right? Accessing the HDFS data nodes directly. And we have the, con uh, the concept of a like, compute pool which is basically used for performing your, your intensive joints or your CPU intensive um, uh, tasks. And so if you think about some of the, for, the use, for all, all the use cases, you don't necessarily have to access or your, all your data uh, in real time, right? So maybe you have to access data uh, at different uh, periods. So for example, uh, you, can, you need to access data every five minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour. You, you don't have to access that data in, in real time. So what we have enabled is the creation of data marts that can actually cache your data. So if you have latency issues 
or maybe you need to stagger things in a certain way in your environment for whatever reason, you can cache that data into your data mart and then through the use of a compute pool, you can join that data with multiple data sources. So as you guys can see, this enables a full scale out solution for SQL Server, accessing multiple data sets and not just your relational data or your data that may be sitting on HDFS, right? You can also access external data sources through Again, the use of Polybase 2.0, uh, you can access Terra data, MongoDB, Oracle, other SQL Server instances, uh, DB2, even SAP instances. And this also enables, of course, bringing your IoT data uh, into the fold. So you can now have a, a different way of dealing with all of, that, of those data sets under the big data cluster umbrella. So it's a pretty game changing proposition, guys. If you haven't, uh, uh, delve into what big data clusters brings into the, into the mix. I highly encourage you guys to take a look at this because I'll bet that your environment will can use something like this today. Right now, I'll, I'll bet that you guys have some sort of ETL, some sort of data movement um, uh, process internally that could use something like this. As opposed to shuffling data around and shifting data around, the proposition of big data clusters is so you're performing a data, you're putting a data virtualization layer on top of all your different data sets and keep the data local, right? And perform computations locally whenever it makes sense to do so and only push data when it's absolutely necessary to do so, right? So to, through the use of predicate pushdowns, what we can do is take those parts of your queries that correspond to different the data sets that are living within each of your um, uh, each of the different components of your architecture and perform computations related to that data right at those nodes. Okay, so it's a very interesting proposition. And this is just uh, framing the what we call the big data cluster in there. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, thanks, Argenis. So uh, I think the the architecture slide you provided is a, a really good example of what's possible in with a modern data platform. And, and I think that's one of the nice things that Linux brings to the table, um, especially when partnering with uh, somebody like Microsoft um, and what they can what they provide in Microsoft SQL. Um, you know, when we think about the evolution of, of the data platform, and I'm sure there's folks on the on this call that are kind of looking at those big data clusters and thinking. I've got no idea how to consume any of that because everybody's on a slightly different path within their journey. Um, but one of the things that we see is that everything is built on the shoulders of everything else. So when we started initially with relational databases and then the emergence of data proliferation and consolidation of uh, data warehouses, which ultimately gave rise to analytics and you know which helps provide data abstraction through business applications we're now at the point where we've generated such a significant amount of data um, and we've, we're also at a point as that architecture previously demonstrates that we're at a better way of learning how to consume analyze and process that data through technologies like big data and hadoop and hdfs and spark and r and you know um, Kafka, for example, another open source technology. But this all really leads us to the ability to start to actually use and consume those AI frameworks that we can actually start to instrument the everyday aspects of our physical world through technologies like IoT. So really, what does SUSE do in this space and what type of pedigree do we have as an operating system for data analytics and IoT workloads? So we're in our 26th year now of being a, an open source company, um, and we've been providing a stable, secure, uh, reliable platform for customers and partners alike. As a data platform, we've been partnering with leading database and analytics providers for decades, many uh, Argenis mentioned previously. And as an OS platform, we've got thousands of those applications certified, uh, those leading databases and data warehouses, including benchmarks with the likes of DB2 and Microsoft SQL and SAP. Um, as the, uh, the data growth has exploded and businesses are looking for that nuance of information in, in a sea of data, we continue to emerge as a platform of choice for a number of partners um, and customers. You can find SUSE Linux Enterprise Server embedded in analytics solutions from partners like Teradata. Um, SAP recommends SUSE Linux with their HANA in-memory database. 
And we're also certified and supported for platforms such as MapR and SAS and MariaDB, for example. So when Microsoft introduced SQL, um, we continued to work with our established partners like HPE and Lenovo um, on the hardware side, and we collaborated with them on a number of different initiatives. So for example, with Lenovo, we did do a installation guide for running tech, uh, transactional workloads on Lenovo Think Systems with SQL Server. Um, we did a record-breaking performance with SQL 2017 with HPE, and we're gonna dive into that in a few minutes in more detail. And you know, we continue to blaze those trails with Hadoop and Apache Spark to uncover those trends and those predictive analysis. Um, and again, partnering with other vendors like Cisco and MapR, we are utilizing our container as a service platform, which Argenis mentions, powered by Kubernetes, um, to integrate with MapR's data fabrics and analyze and consume real-time data from the edge of those IoT sources. So one of the things that I think this Linux evolution with SQL brings to the table is this big data cluster, this ability to stream, this ability to control and manage all of your data from um, the, the SQL environment, um, but really to get access to that data in a completely different way. And we talked about the ELT process. Nobody likes to do that. The goal now is to use microservices and to bring the application to the data. And that's what I think um, Linux provides uh, as a key foundation for this modern data platform, is a, a lot of these open source technologies that we've been talking about are native to Linux. Um, Microsoft made a strategic decision. This is open source technology. They could have ported it to Windows. They could have done a very good job with that but there is such a foundation in Linux and open source that it just made sense, again, to bring the workload engine, Microsoft SQL, to the platform and to the data and where that data resides. Argenis, I wanna turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks Patrick. So guys, I wanted to really give you an idea of what we're all about with SQL Server 2019 and the vision for SQL Server as a data platform overall. We have basically three pillars here on SQL Server on-prem that we are absolutely uh, indispensable. For us, they're like uh, our guidelines on how we actually make SQL Server better all the time, right? We focus a lot on performance and we try to push the envelope every time, make sure that we give you the best quality product from a performance point of view so that you don't, you see SQL Server's value in there, right? SQL Server, you know, I, w I work for the engineering team, but I'll, I'll tell you guys, I am very aware of how much it costs, right? Because I was a customer once. So, you know, for the for the money that you pay for SQL Server, we want to provide you the best, the absolute best value out there. So we put a lot of focus on performance and scalability. I'll tell you, I, I, I sit on the on one of the teams that actually looks at performance on a weekly basis. We have engineers that are dedicated to looking exclusively at performance and they're trying to make improvements day in and day out and make SQL Server better. They look at bottlenecks, they look at every single possible thing that they can look at, make SQL Server better for you guys. From the security point of view, we also have dedicated teams and all they do all day is try to break SQL Server you know, and, and try to look at what areas could be could, could SQL Server potentially improve upon for uh, from to provide you with that sense of, of of strength and and core safety from using SQL Server? And if you look at the amount of patches that all the other RDBMSs have needed over the years, we remain at the lowest possible number, right? Because we we put, we do put a lot of effort in making sure that SQL Server is a it's top notch when it comes to uh, when it comes to providing you with a with a, with a secure product. And on the availability point of view, of course, uh, SQL Server wants to make sure, uh, we want to make sure that we provide you with, you know, a top-notch solution that keeps your availability at the highest. Right? If your system is not available, your data is not available, your business is suffering, and we understand that. So we we have customers that are that have the highest needs of availability. We we're, we're literally running on environments where there is not any chance for downtime ever. Okay, so the customers that cannot go down at all, ever, like a bank, for example, we have tons of those. We have, um, you know, finance is actually one of our uh, strongest areas. And Patrick, I believe we have a, uh, we we have one of the top banks in the world has something like 5,000 instances 
out there. Um, so you guys can imagine the amount of data that's sitting on SQL Server today um, that has to be provided at the highest level of availability. So we are making investments to provide mission critical performance on SQL Server 2019, building on top of the concept of intelligent query processing that we came up with a few years ago. So the idea is that we no longer have SQL Server be just a set of rules, right? Traditionally, you can you can think of the query optimizer as just a, 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 set, a set of uh, uh, if else statements, right? You could roughly think of it as, uh, as that. With the advance, with the advancements on feedback mechanisms and feedback loops that we have seen, um, and and you know the industry all embracing the concept of understanding what happened prior to taking a, the decision for the next step on 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 your workload, we have um, we have kind of taken that concept and, and wrapped the, wrapped it around the query processing engine for SQL Server, and now we can understand what happened prior to executing your next query. So for example, one of the things that we uh, that we are doing now is that we can see what happens when you run your query uh, uh, before, right, through the user query store. If your query performed at a given level of performance, and we notice that there's a degradation of performance on, upon the next run, well, we can actually look at that previous, uh, quer uh, at that previous run's uh, execution plan and actually force that execution plan for the next round or take that and, uh, execution plan that was chosen for initially for that one query and now apply it to the uh, to the workload next right so some of them some of the different features that we have built that kind of embrace this concept here memory grant feedback is another one for example if you run a query and it runs at a given uh, um, a, it places a, give, a request for a given amount of memory what we'll do is I will keep track of that so upon the next um, and we'll, we'll we'll check that memory grant that it was initially requested versus how much it actually used and then we'll take that information for the next time that query runs so if the the grant request was way higher than the actual um, memory used, we'll only place a memory grant request for the amount of memory used next time, right? And hence making the amount available, the amount of memory available to the rest of the queries that are running on your system uh, a lot more efficient and that way allowing better concurrency on your system. So as you can, as you can see, we're doing a lot of things to make SQL Server's engine a lot better. Uh, and this is years ahead of the competition, by the way, guys. And some of the things that we are actually enabling on SQL Server 2019, you can see them bolded there. Um, there is a feature that I that I actually find super interesting, which is the the concept of having approximate uh, uh, results, not exact results. If you guys think about what happens when you have to uh, scan a whole table, you're causing a ruckus on your database, right? Because you have to fetch every single page for that table, bring it into memory, perform some computations on it, and then move on to the next set of pages, right? That when you have to get an exact result, you only have to do it. You, you can only do it that way. Obviously, you can support yourself with indexes and, you know, uh, persistent uh, computer columns and things like that. But imagine if you didn't have to do any of that, right? If you only needed an approximate of how many records actually comply with a given predicate and the, and the query processing engine actually supported that, uh, well, we've built that now in SQL Server where you can tell SQL, hey, give me an approximate of how many people lived on zip code 98052, which is Microsoft zip code, by the way. Yeah, you can get an idea of how many pe how many people uh, live there um, without being exact, right? And maybe that number is all you need to move forward with business decisions. Right? So, for example, if you're trying to get an estimate of roughly how many flowers have been sold on in, in the western states of the United States, you could do something like that. You don't have to go through the entire data set, potentially scanning thousands and thousands of rows and potentially you know billions of rows. So, SQL Server has now uh, a very comprehensive set of uh, features to bring bring us into the 21st century what actually means to handle our relational database and I'll tell you about one of the one, one of the most interesting things that we're doing with SQL Server these days is per, the embracing persistent memory so don't confuse this with persistent storage which is what we mentioned before uh, for kubernetes right um, you can definitely have persistent storage on uh, for containers that can be that can live on any storage device right with persistent memory uh, devices are basically 
uh, your same DRAM sticks that you put on your servers today, right? So your RAM that you buy with your box, you buy CPU, you buy RAM, and you buy storage, right? And you buy networking. Um, well, now you can actually purchase persistent memory devices that fit into those same uh, DRAM slots and give you performance that it's very close to that of DRAM. So now you guys can imagine how this transforms what a database actually does and how it has to behave. Right? When you have a dev when you have memory that is actually persisted, that changes the game. Right? You can do a lot of interesting things with this. Uh, and some of the features that we have built on SQL Server 2019 uh, are full are about fully embracing the fact that persistent memory is going to be with us um, in the future. And this is still just really challenging the uh, traditional computer architectures. Right? So a, a feature that I'm very fond of is hybrid buffer pool. If you think about your buffer pool today or your buffer cache where you load your database pages, uh, what you do is, you know, whenever you have to access a page for whatever reason, you fetch it, you go fetch it from storage, you look it up on the buffer pool first to see if that it's available in memory already. Uh, even if it's not there, then you go ahead and you copy it from the storage device into the buffer pool, right? And this is where you see all the all, all these uh, uh, latches taking place and all these things. Right, um, and when the when the page once the page is loaded in memory, into memory, then we can perform computations on that page, right? But hybrid buffer pool doesn't do any of that when your database pages are actually sitting on the on on a persistent memory device. If you have your database files sitting on a PMEM device, what we will do is that we will directly access those pages on on PMEM without copying them into DRAM, because we don't necessarily need to do that, right? So that's how we're changing the game here with persistent memory and, and how we're making SQL Server 2019 uh, a better product for the future. We're shaping SQL Server to be you know, a, a super relevant uh, database engine for, for the foreseeable future. Anyway, Patrick, if you want to talk a little bit more about persistent memory. Yeah, so you're stealing all my thunder, but I can tell you're excited about it. So um, I think you summed it up. You're absolutely right. So you can think of persistent memory as uh, having the speed of DRAM, but the persistence of storage. Um, we had <clears throat> we had HPE come to us uh, about two and a half years ago and said, we've got this crazy idea for persistent, mem persistent memory. Um, and, and the reason why they wanted to engage this was because when, when you think about an SAP workload, an SAP HANA, for example, and you're, you're maybe dealing with an in-memory database of 30 terabytes, that takes a long time to read off disk and put in memory. But if you could directly access the, the DRAM type of persistent storage that Genesis is talking about, if you're bringing up a, a server from a downstate or if you're doing a recovery, this significantly reduces your downtime. It's one of the ways to reduce your downtime. Obviously, availability is another way, and we'll talk about that in the future. But persistent memory is one of those things where you directly access the data um, at the speed of DRAM. And here's, so HPE came to us. They said they want to do this thing. We worked with them on a kernel patch. We put it into SLES 12 SP3. And ultimately, what happens is that, um, by using scalable persistent memory, HPE, they called this their diskless database, they were able to deliver the number one TCPH benchmark. And here's some of the details. So they published a world record benchmark at over a thousand gigabyte results using SQL 2017 on SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 12. And the result eclipsed the previous one million query per hour for a, a one teradice, terad by database on a two socket server. Um, it was roughly a, a 40, over a 40% performance increase. And, and everybody kind of stopped and said, well, that's not right. We can't go from a, a two socket server, just add persistent memory and suddenly increase performance by 47%. Well, that's exactly what had happened. So they really went back and they scrutinized these results to make sure that what they were seeing uh, again, a, a thousand gigabyte results on a terabyte database, um, a world record holder has not been smashed and it hasn't been smashed yet. And, and I think this is, let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about uh, a little bit of a preview, so to speak, of what's coming in SQL 2019. So just last week at HPE Discover, um, HPE demonstrated 
their next iteration of their diskless database server. Now this is a little bit different because they're not using their own persistent storage solution. They're actually using one from Intel, the Intel Optanes. Um, and it is a little bit different. So what they demonstrated is that it, by stepping up the game a little bit from going from a DL380 to a DL560, which is increasing the SOC account by two up to four, using three terabytes of volatile DRAM memory, traditional RAM, and 12 terabytes of persistent memory, um, again, provided by those Intel Optane chips that you see at the top there, they've, they again have reduced um, the required rack space and power consumption that would traditionally be required for a cluster of servers in order to meet this database size. So what you're looking at here is the ability, because these Optane disks, uh, you can get, I think, 512 gigabytes per per slot. You're per able dim, to, yeah. per dim, you're able to consolidate a lot of storage, JBODs, storage arrays, reduce your cabinet space, reduce your power consumption, and not only that, but increase performance. So what HPE did, again, stepping up the game, they uh, they moved to SLES 15, so Linux Enterprise Server 15 from SLES 12. Um, and just taking a page from the Microsoft Windows team, we actually skipped version 13 and 14 for cultural reasons. So we are on SLES 15. We released it back in July of 2018. Uh, so it's only a, a few months out in market. But in the next slide, we're going to provide a little bit of a peek as to what some of the differences are between the technical preview in 2019 and uh, the, the shipping version of SQL 2017. So again, this is all done on SUSE Linux with uh, Intel Optane's on um, HPE's diskless database. And you'll see here the comparison, the dark blue is 2017, the lighter blue is 2019. Um, and again, this is a tech preview, so it's not actually benchmark yet. But what they did was they ran a series of queries. And just to give you an idea as to what they were working against, this is a 10 terabyte data warehouse with a number of tables. Um, some of the tables are between uh, 1.5 billion and 60 billion rows. And then some other tables are a little bit more uh, manageable in, in the 10 million row range. And they ran a number of different queries, clearing the cache between each query to demonstrate not only just the persistent memory capabilities that they had done in 2017 as a bare metal solution, but what 2019 of SQL Server can bring to the table now that Microsoft is again focused in on this technology. And, and I think this demonstrates something that's culturally unique between infrastructure companies. So when you think about Microsoft starting off with in the Windows space and evolving into the Windows Server space, and, and SUSE again being an open source infrastructure company, infrastructure matters, performance matters, availability matters. And I think these are some of the synergies that we've got in this space. And I think we're gonna talk a little bit about mission critical and availability in the next slide. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Orgenis. You guys have about 14 minutes left. That's perfect, thank okay. you. All right, guys, so uh, security, like, like we said before, is super important for SQL Server. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're one of the most, the most secure platforms out there. And one of the really interesting things that we're fully embracing this, this is the concept of secure enclaves. So if you guys think about how computing has traditionally been in the past, you have always been bound by the fact that a system administrator or root on a Linux system will be able to debug your running process, will be able to access memory addresses within that within that process and get data from there, right? So if you're a Windows administrator, you would just WinDBG something and attach to that running process and start capturing data right from that process memory space. Uh, in Linux, you would, do, uh, you would do a very similar thing, right? Uh, and so the concept of secure enclaves is that you can now have hardware protected areas of memory where you can perform confidential computing right and do really interesting and have really interesting use cases fully embracing the concept of separation of duties here 
right? So for example, if you know you guys know today that always encrypted takes your data, encrypts it at the client level, right? The, cert the, the certificates for encryption, the, the data needed for encryption exists only on the application server side. And then it sends ciphertext down to SQL Server, right? So on the SQL Server engine, you wouldn't be able to tell exactly what that data was all about. So we would run into really significant issues trying to index that data and try to perform, you know, matching of what data is where. Right, and give and give you better performance on always encrypted was always a challenge. But now with secure enclaves, you can have an area of memory where we can take that ciphertext, decrypt it, perform operations within that data, and then uh, write uh, and then only return ciphertext back to the up uh, to the uh, plain text memory space. So now you can think as your entire memory space as being segmented out between, with, um, between plain text and cipher text areas or areas that are just not accessible uh, to system administrators at all. Or if you're a system admin, the hardware actually prevents you from uh, reading that memory space. But if you try to win DVG that process, all you get, all you get will be zeros. And if you try to do something similar on Linux, you will get the exact you get the exact same result, right? You wouldn't have a way um, to access those memory addresses because the hardware is physically preventing you from doing so. So we're embracing that with SQL Server 2019, uh, and we're doing um, we're doing always encrypted with secure enclaves. Um, so we're doing more interesting things on the security space, like classifying and classifying your data and making sure that you can actually label what your data is all about, uh, so you can clearly tell you know what data is sensitive from what data is not we're also embracing um, the or trying to make the experience of managing certificates a lot easier with SQL Server Configuration Manager, where in the past it was really difficult for you to just take certificates that would allow you to uh, perform encryption on SQL Server connections. We're now making that a lot easier within SQL Server con uh, Configuration Manager. And so on the availability side, we're making a number of investments as well. Um, we're focusing on uh, always on availability groups uh, because, you know, so much needed time, engineering time was needed there, right? Um, some of the things that we're doing on availability groups is fully embracing the concept of Kubernetes, right? So on Linux, you only had Pacemaker as a uh, as the way of of doing clustering. But now with Kubernetes, with now with Kubernetes and the ability for you to run AGs on Kubernetes, um, we are we are allowing you to have you know the same availability that you would experience on a on a Windows Server failover cluster or on a Pacemaker cluster um, on top of a Kubernetes cluster. So you're now you can have um, uh, a, a a means for you to run a Kubernetes cluster, uh, so to speak, uh, for your uh, availability groups. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting proposition. And there's also things that we have done to make sure that SQL Server actually provides you with even more uh, avenues of uh, of minimizing the impact of maintenance on your on your on your database. For example, resumable on the online index creation just it's a game changing proposition, right? Um, you in the past, if you wanted to index uh, re-index a table, rebuild an index on a table, um, you would basically incur it into all sorts of performance issues, right? Um, and, the, and it, it was an all or nothing proposition as well. So if you needed to rebuild that index, you would either let it complete or just back out or roll it back or roll back roll back that in, that index creation altogether if, if you're running into performance issues. Well, now with SQL Server 2019, you're going to be able to pause that online index creation and just um, continue on from you where you left off whenever you whenever you're ready to continue that operation. And so we're giving you knobs to control how your server behaves or how your workload behaves um, with a lot more granularity than you had in the past. So now you have online index, col online cl cluster column store index creation and rebuild as well, right, which was a significant uh, pain point out there. So a lot of investments are going into the availability area here for SQL Server 2019. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> go ahead. And I, th and I think, um, you know, we talked a little bit about it on, this, on the next slide. For, for us, it really comes down to meeting the customer wherever they are in their transition. Um, you know, Kubernetes is, is a wonderful solution for orchestration and to create availability zones by, by leveraging the resiliency of Kubernetes and, and the, uh, the container pods. But one of the things that, that we do is, again, as you mentioned, around Pacemaker is actually 
give you the option to create those high availability clusters, um, whether those are physical servers or virtual servers, we can work with your application through the resource agents that we publish through um, Pacemaker and Corosync to actually help manage the failover based on the requirements of your organization. So whether it's an availability or a timeout issue, we can go and fail over to another cluster, either in the same data center or actually in the data center that's run remotely. Um, and this is one of the things that I think from an infrastructure perspective that, that we share is that if you want to do this virtualized, if you want to do this in a physical environment, um, or you want to step forward into a Kubernetes environment, depending on where you are in your life cycle, uh, I think both SUSE and Microsoft have options for you that you can explore. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is just a, uh, that was just a, the, the last part of that slide was just basically by showing you how um, AGs run on top of Kubernetes there. Anyway, uh, Patrick, you want to take this? Yeah, so um, in addition to the, the pacemaker and the core sync that we, we actually share in common with uh, SQL, um, we've been doing high availability in real world enterprises for, for decades. In fact, it's one of the reasons why SAP depends on us as one of their primary operating systems. Um, we've actually got customers that run air traffic control systems in, in major countries that are running SUSE high availability solutions. And uh, we even have customers running high availability inside of Microsoft Azure, right? So there's definitely different needs of customers out there and we, we work to be flexible in there. But availability actually goes beyond just the infrastructure. I mean, we do think that infrastructure matters, um, but our passion for availability doesn't stop there. When faced with the challenge of adopting to change, we also think the kernel matters. We demonstrated how the kernel matters when we talked about innovating around persistent storage, and we continue to drive <clears throat> towards a zero downtime environment with other solutions like kernel live patching. And this gives us the ability to actually patch a running Linux kernel without halting any operations, without halting processes. So if, if you have a maintenance window on a Friday and then Monday morning you wake up and you find there's a new vulnerability in uh, Linux, we can actually patch that vulnerability without taking the kernel offline and thereby reduce unplanned downtime of having to take your systems down the week after a planned maintenance outage. So, you know, as Argenis pointed out, if you're looking for a robust container infrastructure, we go beyond building or supporting those traditional applications in, into more of a cloud native application delivery platform using containers as a service and built around our enterprise OS. And we only have a few minutes left, so I'm just gonna kind of uh, summarize on the next slide, Argenis, and then we'll get into um, what's coming up next in the, the past webinar series. So to sum up, we're trying to provide a, a consistent platform from the edge to the core to the cloud. Um, depending on where you are in your journey, you can be doing this physically, virtually, or containerized. We'd like you to consider SUSE when doing that. We recognize that there's multitude of platforms, everything from physical to virtual, x86, ARM, we support a lot of it. And our kernel enables you to take advantage of a lot of those capabilities, the multiple CPUs, the NUMA based architectures, GPU computing, which I don't even think we touched today, um, and other emerging technologies like persistent storage. So when you need to embrace a fit for purpose analytics solutions, like a big data solution for the first time, Linux is probably going to be your choice, and I think SUSE creates an opportunity for you to do that. The great thing is that SUSE also creates the opportunity for you to manage that through Microsoft SQL mm -hmm. and perform at high I.O. and high response times, specifically with what's coming soon in 2019. So in the next slide, we, we've got a little bit of an offer. Um, both Microsoft and SUSE have an offer so you can take advantage of some uh, discounts. And, and in our case, we're actually providing you a year's worth of a subscription for free. Uh, the Microsoft offer, the 30% discount, uh, is good until June of uh, 2019, June 30th. Uh, the SUSE offer is good till June, I'm sorry, April 19th of 2019. So uh, it's an opportunity for you to go out there and try SQL and Linux and see that it's actually a little bit boring because it just works and it works really well and Microsoft's done a great job on it. Um, the next slide, just a, a quick 
commercial for some upcoming webinars. Um, we're going to dive deeper into a lot of these topics. We talked about high availability, and I've seen some of the questions. People want to know what does a high availability architecture look like? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk to you about how to do that with SQL and how to do that with SUSE. We're going to talk about containerization. Microsoft provides Helm charts so you can deploy SQL into a containerized environment. We have a container platform that you might want to consider. We're going to dive into that. So mark your calendars for some of the upcoming events, and we're going to dive deeper into some of the topics that we kind of just glossed over today at a very high level. Sharon? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, both. It was very interesting. I have some questions. Uh, the first one is for someone with a small number of SQL servers on Windows, are there reasons to switch to Linux? So I'll provide a little bit of guidance and then I'll, I think our Dennis will have some feedback. Um, you know, SUSE recognizes that we live in a heterogeneous environment. So if, if Windows is your platform of choice and, and you have an investment in Windows, we're completely fine with that. Um, but if you're starting to recognize that you need to embrace microservices, if you're starting to recognize that maybe an analytics solution like Apache Spark running on Hadoop is something for you, then consolidating onto a common platform could be a, a revenue saving opportunity for you. Or Janice? Yeah, I, I, I share the sentiment, right? If you're comfortable with Windows and Windows is all you know, well, guess what? We're not just dropping support for Windows, right? We are just offering choice with SQL Server on Linux. Uh, choice is literally the word that we use internally for um, for the breadth of platforms that we're now supporting. We want to offer you ways of running SQL Server in a lot of different places where before you couldn't do that, right? Where before you could only run SQL Server on, on Windows. We're not... Um, uh, discarding investments on the Windows side whatsoever, right? We continue to look at Windows as a, a one of our main platforms for running SQL Server. We, we, we realize that uh, more and more customers are going to be embracing uh, Linux as a, as a platform, and we're totally fine with run, you running SQL Server on either of them. Next question. What is the SQL Server master instance, and how does it work? Right, so your SQL Server master instance is just a traditional SQL Server instance, right? Uh, the details on whether we will support Linux only or Windows only on that one master instance are still kind of up in the air. We haven't uh, fully committed to, um, to uh, either of those, uh, but a SQL Server master instance is just a SQL Server instance. Uh, the difference with that master instance that can actually have it, uh, have a control plane for your entire SQL Server uh, big data clusters infrastructure running underneath it. Uh, but it's no different than it's just a traditional SQL Server instance, yeah. Can you please describe some architectures that can never go down and how zero downtime is achieved? <laughs> so Murphy's Law will always reign supreme. That's the first thing we always have to recognize when architecting uh, high availability solutions. Um, but it really does depend on you understanding where your faults are. And I think we're going to cover this with Balaji in one of the upcoming webinars. But you have to understand that sometimes it's disks that fail, that it's network cards that fail, that it's systems that fail, or applications that hang, or uh, data centers that go offline. So <clears throat> it really is a tiered approach to that problem that you have to take into consideration. And we'll talk a little bit about that in one of the upcoming webinars. You know what, Patrick, I, I, when you say tiered approach, you resonated so much with me. T making sure that your environment is up and running 100% of the time means not relying on any one single component in your environment to be up and running all the time. And that includes SQL Server. Right? Yep. So if you want to build a high availability solution, you have to stop thinking that SQL Server uh, will not fail. Right. You have to consider the scenario where SQL Server can fail and other components can fail. Right. So if, if you need to maintain that, high, that level of availability, that 100% uptime availability, you have to also engage your application developers and make sure that they do in, intelligent logic and at the application level to detect what happens when a SQL Server goes down and take action from that. So this is how, you know, just, just a, this is just a taste for how do you actually architect a high availability solution. Yeah, <clears throat> and then, you know, going beyond 
high availability is something we talked about with SUSE's live patching capabilities. A lot of the downtime is plan downtime. You've got to take your systems down to patch them. You've got to take your systems down to update them. So one of the things we've done is, again, give you the ability to patch a running kernel. And you can actually keep that running kernel up and running for roughly a year before you want to reboot it, because as you do that, you're actually chewing up memory space. But the other thing is, is we're looking to see, can we bring this to the user space, right? That's the kernel space. That's the security vulnerability space that we can ad ad address. But can we bring that to the user space, which means maybe at some point in the future, just hypothetical, you'll be able to patch your SQL instance live without actually bringing it down. That's something that we might be able to, to facilitate together in the future. So it's not just about outages. How, how are traditional Active Directory permissions handled in a pure Linux environment? Are the Linux MSQL, MSSQL permission management utilities that re replicate Active Directory group policy, or is a Windows server always required to manage policy as a group permission? Yes, yeah, so I think I'll let Janice kind of cover some of that. But one of, one of the things I'll say is that we, way back in 2006, uh, Microsoft and SUSE signed an agreement. One of the things that we focused on in that agreement was the ability to, to work together um, around identity management. Um, so we actually have um, user authentication modules that, uh, based off of Open LDAP, that you can actually use to tie your Linux servers to your Active Directory environment so that you have that consistent sign-on experience from the, the Linux environment based on your Active Directory environment. So in that particular scenario, yeah, Active Directory would still be a, a role. And we understand it, how important Active Directory is to a number of customers, which is why we, we choose to integrate well with it. Or Janice? Yeah, I don't have a lot to add there. I mean, we do have support for uh, Active Directory uh, within SQL Server Surf. Naturally, uh, you know, if you're handling your um, your policies through GPOs today, then you have to look at all, uh, you know, of, our, of what Patrick mentioned before. Uh, but on the SQL Server side, we can definitely, um, you know, manage AD permissions, no problem. And there's one final question. Why SUSE over Ubuntu or Red Hat? Oh, boy, that's definitely for Patrick. Oh, okay, you don't want to take a swing at it. So, um, you know, it really comes it really comes down to a little bit of a philosophical difference as to which distribution you choose. Um, I can point back to the, the performance slide, that benchmark. Uh, that SUSE was over to was able to beat was actually a Red Hat benchmark that we beat. So um, we focus a lot on the kernel. We think the kernel matters. Um, we focus a lot on making sure we can bring in new technologies like persistent memory, like live patching. Um, we're constantly innovating very early in the open source development process. Um, when you, when you look at what Red Hat does, yes, they are an open source company. Uh, they tend to have a little bit of a different approach to open source. We work strictly in the open source community. Red Hat tends to like to control the development process and then release the open source as the product is released. Um, and a lot of times it just comes down to, um, you know, maybe we've got a better price point or maybe you've got a better resonance with how the SUSE culture is versus the Red Hat culture or the Ubuntu culture. Um, so, you know, it really does come down to personal choice. If anybody wants to dive into more detail uh, on that topic, I'm more than happy to have that conversation. You can send me an email at pjq at SUSE.com and I'll be more than happy to have that conversation with you. Okay, that's all the questions. Thank you both for an interesting and exciting presentation. Uh, I'm a Windows freak, and so all this Linux stuff is very new to me. Um, and I look forward to your next presentations, and I thank you for joining us. We will post the recording uh, what, what, when I get around to it, which will probably be sometime this week or early next week. Thanks, everybody, for attending. I'm going to end the webinar, and we'll see you the next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.